My name is Carolyn Delaney. I'm the founder and CEO here at Journey Enterprises. We're a media company on a mission to make recovery from addiction visible because it's important. It saves lives. There are 20, over 26 million of us in recovery, and we want those who are still sick and suffering to know that there's a path for them. There's millions of us here on the other side of active addiction, and that it's probable that people can and do recover. Our videos share personal intimate stories of what people's journeys were like, going from what it was like to what happened to what it's like now, um, in an effort to let people know that we're here, we care, and that there's a way out. Visible recovery saves lives, and we want the world to know that. So if you have a story about recovery and would like to share it, uh, please contact me, carolyn at recovery-journey.com. I hope you enjoy our videos. I'm Doug Dunbar. I live in Herman, outside of Bangor. I'm employed at Eastern Maine Development Corporation in, in Bangor, a nonprofit. You know, I grew up in Bangor, and I tell people it was sort of an idyllic upbringing. I didn't drink. My friends really didn't drink. In high school, I was the kid who drove people so that um, the few that did want to drink had someone to, uh, to safely uh, get them around and get them home at night. Uh, even in college, I went to college at uh, Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I drank some, but I never really liked the taste of it. Um, and um, my drinking actually began uh, when the terrorist attacks occurred on September 11, 2001. So I was raised with that sort of epic and those values. And so I wanted my job, my career, to be about helping people. So I wanted to combine this interest in government politics with helping folks. So um, on September 11, 2001, when I was working for John in Washington, that was when I began drinking. But there's something to my story that predates all of, all of that which is that from my earliest recollections as a child, I suffered from two mental illnesses that I told no one about. Not my parents, not my two sisters. Uh, I had a loving family, great people, but I didn't want to tell them that I was the mentally ill kid. And I knew that I suffered from mental illness from, a, from an early age. Obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and anxiety disorder. And I just found ways to manage. But on September 11th, 2001, when the terrorist attacks occurred, my symptoms went out of control. And the next night, literally the next night, I was having dinner with a friend at a restaurant when the restaurants reopened the next day. And we drank a lot of wine. I realized this will help. Uh, and so I began uh, truly to self-medicate. Uh, very privately, uh, very quietly. I started with a bottle of vodka because I didn't like the taste of alcohol, but I found that I had put enough lemon or lime or orange in the glass with the fizzy water and the vodka, I could get it down. Uh, literally the way you would think of trying to get down bad tasting medicine. So that was what it was like initially. And I, I used this medicine really when I felt like I needed it. So it might have been a couple of times a week. My family and friends and coworkers and employers still knew nothing about the mental illnesses, knew nothing about the self-medicating. And what I didn't think about when I began using alcohol in that way is that there were plenty of alcoholics in my family. You know, I, I, be, I became an alcoholic I think not too long, or I began drinking out in an alcoholic fashion, um, not long after I started. But 
I was meticulous about hiding everything, the mental illness, the self-medicating. And then I was able to conceal my first few encounters with law enforcement. Um, I had not been stopped yet for OUI. I hadn't had any uh, encounters with law enforcement, but I knew that I had a drinking problem at the time. So by the time my legal problem started, I had moved on from being Deputy Secretary of State to being a Deputy Commissioner in another department. And again, I thought with that first stop for OUI in Wells, Maine, uh, that everyone would find out. They didn't. They also didn't find out when I received uh, a summons for OAS, operating after suspension. They didn't find out on my third arrest or my fourth arrest. I became the poster child of what can happen when you allow these issues related to alcohol and driving to snowball. All the things I had, you know, cautioned people about, I did and uh, have experienced the consequences. This all came to a head on my sixth arrest, not until my sixth arrest, did it all fall apart and did people find out. That occurred in October of 2017, approaching three years ago. My sixth arrest, this time in Bangor, and uh, it was clear to me that this wasn't going to be an overnight thing. My sixth arrest, this time I spent four and a half months in jail. And um, I was released in March of 2018 to enter the Penobscot County Adult Drug Treatment Court, Drug Court. I spent 15 months there in the program. You go home, but you're, you're part of this drug court program. And 15 months later, I graduated. And I'm reaching into my pocket now for my prop. I carry uh, this coin around every day. When you graduate from a drug court at Maine, you get this very nice coin. And I do carry it every day as a reminder um, of what I learned and what I've been through. I'm blessed today to work in a job where I'm able to help people, others who are in drug court currently, both in Penobscot County and in other counties. My journey to recovery started before I stopped drinking. Uh, after, I don't even remember my third arrest maybe, my second OUI, I know that, I turned to my employers, the state of Maine's Employee Assistance Program, EAP. And I said, I called the number and I said, I need help. I don't want anyone to know, but I need help. So I did get connected with uh, a mental health counselor in Bangor, and we quickly agreed that I would need medication for my OCD and anxiety, that these were so ingrained in me and part of me that talk therapy with a counselor wasn't going to be adequate. I would stop drinking. It seemed like a good plan. However, I was too far gone in terms of my alcoholism to give up the drinking. I made attempts, but um, it, well, I obviously wasn't successful. So, um, so getting mental health care, which I advocate for a lot of people I meet these days who seek recovery or are in recovery, um, so many of us do suffer, I believe, from co-occurring disorders, a term I wasn't familiar with uh, until I got into recovery. But um, there is a, you know, there is a lot of hope and there are a lot of ways to, to heal. And for me, it's been through mental health care, um, you know, being active in the recovery community, my friend Lee knew about my newfound passion for helping people who are either trying to be in recovery or are in re early recovery or are re-entering communities from jails and prisons. Um, and he said, Doug, we have a division uh, within EMDC 
that works with people who have challenges in moving forward with education, training, and ultimately meaningful employment. And I said, sign me up. And I've been with uh, EMDC for well over a year now. And I am so fortunate that my work not only uh, hopefully helps uh, these individuals, but it certainly helps my own recovery. In talking with these young guys, I, I realized even if they know there is help out there, they don't know how to connect with it. They don't know how to, you know, sign up for services. So fortunately, uh, the work that I do nowadays is to help these individuals connect with the services that are out there. And the hopeful part is there are services uh, in the greater Bangor area. We are really fortunate to have the Bangor Area Recovery Network, the barn, um, and many other 12-step uh, programs uh, and 12-step meetings in the area, along with many other services and providers. Well, my life today is uh, dramatically different. I don't wake up every morning feeling ill, which I did many or most mornings before I went to jail. Uh, I don't wake up wondering what crazy messages did I send through my work email or my personal email. What uh, obnoxious things did I write on Facebook the night before? Because uh, toward the end, you know, um, I, you know, was blacking out and doing things that I would not remember the next day. Um, there were a couple of occasions near the very end when my boss, the commissioner of a department, would send me an email in the morning to say, hey, can I talk with you about that message you left on my office phone last night? And I would have no recollection. I worked in government for 30 years. I'm not sure I ever gave much thought to people who uh, were suffering from uh, addiction, who were incarcerated, who were trying to get their life together, um, you know, in early recovery. I'm not sure that I gave these populations, which I'm a part of, much thought. So um, I'm trying to make up a lost time, in a sense, try to reach out to um, businesses and other employers to say people in recovery can be an asset. I tell people I am a much, much better person and employee now than when I was hiding my drinking and my work was suffering and I was not fully engaged with what I was doing. Um, today, because of all of the problems that I caused myself. For me, you know, a full hopeful recovery is about having purpose and contributing um, and staying in contact with people. My name is Mark Lefebvre. I live in the seacoast of New Hampshire, uh, specifically Hampton Falls. Um, I live here with my wife Vivian and my two adult children who are kind of hunkered down with us over the pandemic. Um, let's see, I've been in recovery for uh, eight plus years and um, I guess what I identify most with is alcohol and opiate addiction. I'm also what is a uh, characterized as dual diagnosis, a co-occurring disorder. So I have uh, been diagnosed with um, some pretty severe mental illness that is under control, uh, specifically depression, anxiety. I grew up in a family where um, it wasn't common. It wasn't, we weren't mentored or we weren't shown the way to show our, uh, our emotional needs and to con communicate with our parents and each other regarding our uh, emotional needs. And so in a lot of ways, um, I was emotionally um, neglected as a child. I spent most of my childhood, um, I wouldn't say alone, um, but I was very comfortable uh, being in isolation. Um, I was, uh, 
Yeah, so um, I, al I also grew up in a family where, um, you know, physical abuse and um, emotional abuse was prevalent in the form of shaming and, and physical punishment. Yeah, I've been into treatment twice, um, inpatient treatment uh, twice uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit because that's part of my uh, recovery journey. So I had this huge crater in my life in terms of trauma, neglect, abuse, and so forth. And when I was in my early teens, I found um, alcohol and, and, and drugs in the form of initially marijuana. Um, I was a daily marijuana smoker in high school, uh, even though I was in um, taking AP courses. I was a straight A student, played baseball, I played football, and um, I was able to, I was a high functioning, and on weekends I would binge drink. And um, I'm one of these people uh, where I wouldn't drink to black out, but I would drink for as long as it took to maintain an even keel. I was, I was using the buzz to fill the hole that was created as a result of my unmet uh, me mental needs. It allowed me to um, fit in with other people and it allowed me to ignore what was really going on inside me. So alcohol and drugs served a purpose and it served a purpose and it served me well until it didn't and it didn't because I started having consequences, um, uh, jail time, um, uh, crashing and totaling a company car, um, you know, getting into dangerous situations. And that's what brought me to my knees when I was, um, I was in my mid fifties and um, I was working, I, I spent the last 22 years working as an executive at IBM. So I, like I said, I was a very high, fun, highly functioning alcoholic and drug addict. Um, I was prescribed benzos. I was taking uh, Xanax on a daily basis. I was taking um, Ambien to sleep on a, on a daily basis. I was uh, using Oxy, Oxycontin and its derivatives on a um, daily basis. And I was drinking on a daily basis. And that mix um, has killed a lot of people. You know, my secret life was discovered by those around me and my world came crashing down. And it wasn't as if I was even really trying to hide it. And, um, and I was living in an abyss. Um, in um, August of uh, 2012, um, I was planning to take my life. And um, I had a plan and I was about to act on that plan. I was in a place where my addiction was more important to me than the love I had for my family. And um, at the time, my kids were in their teens. So it was more appealing to me to take my life than it was to wake up and have to deal with this again. Fortunately, through the love of those around me, um, I was able to extract myself long enough to make that phone call to the doctor. And I ended up going into Portsmouth Hospital's behavioral unit where I was um, cared for for about five days. And then I went off to California to 28-day inpatient and another 28 day intensive outpatient. I lived in a sober living home with people that were my son's age, my daughter's age. I surrendered uh, to the point where I would do anything to get out of that life that I was living. Um, I went back into treatment about four years into my sobriety, um, not because I had relapsed, but because I was still crazy and I hadn't resolved any of the emotional issues that I had experienced or that I was experiencing. And that's where I learned how to um, address the trauma from my childhood uh, through a lot of very skilled doctors and uh, techniques such as EMDR. Um, what other thoughts or suggestions would you have for the person who's watching this going? I would say that there have been innumerable gifts that have come my way after I decided to take that first step to get help that none of that would have taken place, none of these gifts, none of my enlightenment, none of my service to others, none of my um, experiences that have taken place since then would have taken place if I would have acted on my, my, my impulses. And so my, my advice is to recognize that even if you don't understand it yet, and even if you don't accept it yet, the end of your story is not yet written. So tell me, what is it like today for you living in recovery? What does your program of recovery look like? What kinds of tools or resources do you take advantage of? My recovery is centered around being in the moment, whether it's, um, you know, where I am and what, what point in my life I'm at. I, I try to stay in the moment. And so I've arrived at a place where I know that I can't control the future. However, I can make choices today that help set the future in motion that I think is 
in play. My reason for having a higher power is not to worship, it's to base, basically develop a sense of humility that, you know, I'm beholden to something else that's bigger than me. Um, and it is, um, teaches me things like gratitude. Um, I'm grateful for, you know, whatever it is that comes my way, even if it's not my way. I've regained the power of choice um, and being in the moment. My senses are on steroids. Um, colors are brighter, uh, food tastes better, um, music is sweeter. And, um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm seeing things that I never thought I'd ever see um, around me. So my recovery basically started with 12 steps. I've done the steps. I, I knew how to put the drink or the drug down. I did not know how to live my life in sobriety. And so that's what I learned by doing the 12 steps. Uh, my wife and I founded a recovery center, Safe Harbor Recovery Center in Portsmouth. Um, I do radio. I, I, so I surround myself with things that I love to do. So photography, fishing, hunting, camping, hiking, um, but music and doing a radio show every week um, in Portsmouth, as well as a podcast series that I do on our uh, addiction and recovery that's oriented towards families as opposed to addicts themselves. I take time to work my program. Even eight years in, I go to at least three and most of the time four meetings a week. I have a service position at one of those meetings. You know what? I just, I just end my day with gratitude. I begin my day with hope and I end my day with gratitude. Do you have any particular techniques or tools that you call upon when you see yourself starting to future trip or starting to regret the, fa the past that allows you to sort of pull it back into the present moment? My hobbies in meditation, meditation, um, listening to music. I put together a playlist in my radio show and I have to be in the moment listening as to, you know, will this work in the format that I have? Does the song segue into the next segue? Doing things and thinking about things that keep me grounded in the moment. We talked before about regaining the power of choice, and this gives you a choice in contributing to your own well-being, right? As somebody who's a former drug addict and, and alcoholic, um, I had a lot of faulty belief systems. So I believe that I wasn't good enough. I believe that I wasn't going to be successful. We can't change our feelings, but we can change our thought process. And if we change our faulty beliefs, the outcome is a change in feelings. So you can't necessarily, I can't necessarily um, say, I'm not going to be depressed today, but I can say, okay, what is it that's leading to this? I can change my reaction to that, which eventually will lead me to a place where I'm not feeling depressed or anxious or angry or fearful. Do you have any last parting experiences, ideas, recommendations? I'll go back to my comment earlier about the end of your story has not yet been written and stick around long enough to see the gifts. We call them promises in the program that I'm in. You could advance in your career. You can learn a new trade. You can, you can do things that you never thought were possible.